Hey, and welcome to those who are joining us online. We're glad that you're part of our day. A question for you. If you were given the ability, the power, the authority to make any decision you wanted in life, what decision would you make? And uh, uh, an interesting question about that, uh, if you had that kind of power and that kind of influence, how do you think you would use it? And uh, which raises a question, because some people do have that kind of power and influence, so how are they doing? And uh, I think a lot of us uh, at least have questions, if not some frustrations about those kinds of things. We're going to see today that Jesus was given amazing power and authority. The question is, how did he use it? How did he act? How did he treat other people? And so we're in Matthew chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 29. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. The story starts with some irony. It's actually two blind men sitting on the roadside that see who Jesus really is. They use very specific terms, Lord and son of David to identify that. And these are not just nicknames. They're not just things that people threw about casually in that day. And because of these two blind men, we're actually going to learn some things about Jesus. We're going to see the kind of people who approached Jesus. We're going to see the way that they approached Jesus. We're going to see how others responded when people were trying to approach Jesus. We're going to see how Jesus responded when people were trying to approach him. We're, we're going to see what the results of all of that were. So the context is that Jerusalem is getting ready to celebrate Passover. It's one of the most significant holy holidays in the Jewish calendar, and lots of people are making pilgrimages to Jerusalem in order to be a part of this great celebration. And so lots of people are already there, and there's a large crowd that's following Jesus. And so it's busy, it's loud, and it's crowded, kind of like around here on a Sunday, only less donuts, that kind of thing. And... Uh, the blind men uh, call him Lord, which in Matthew's gospel is a very specific term. People who come to Jesus and they have questions, they're not bought in, uh, they may even be skeptical. They usually refer to him as teacher or rabbi. But in Matthew's gospel, when people say Lord, it's, it tends to indicate that people already believe something about who Jesus is and why Jesus is here. And then they use the term son of David. And this is really specific. Uh, this is a title signifying that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the person who's supposed to come and assume the throne of Israel and make everything right for this country again. And so the, the blind men are crying out. And what are they crying for? What they're crying for is mercy. Have mercy on us. They see Jesus as someone who wants to help and wants to save. In our world, we hear lots of voices that are being raised and they're crying out for many things. But what they're crying out for is often not for mercy. It's, it's for some kind of force or power to be brought to bear, to wrestle something from the hands of, of someone who's holding on too tightly and needs to be shared or, or some kind of power. But, but Jesus, Jesus sees these individuals and they understand who Jesus is. This is someone you can ask for mercy. He has come to save. And this is what's really interesting is that something has changed. 
All through Matthew's gospel, anytime someone made a public declaration of Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus being the Messiah, Jesus being the one that God chose, that that he's the special anointed one, every time in Matthew's gospel, Jesus always tells them, you need to be quiet about that. And this time he doesn't. Why? Because it is time. Something has shifted. Something has changed. As Jesus begins to approach Jerusalem, something is happening that's different from everything that has transpired in his ministry up to this point. It was time for Jesus to be seen for who he was. And that time was right then, right now. Now, the crowd of followers, when they heard these two blind men yelling out, they scolded them, they rebuked them, they told them they they needed to be quiet. Anybody here ever been told to be quiet? Isn't that an enjoyable experience? Don't you just love that? And uh, uh, it is amazing to me how sometimes people who are actually following Jesus say and do things that keep other people from following Jesus. I don't think they were trying to do that. They just, well, what are the reasons? Why would they try to silence? And and we don't know. Maybe it was just their their yelling that made them uncomfortable. For example, if a person just started yelling out in the middle of the service today, it would make you uncomfortable. It would make me uncomfortable. But their only response was, you need to quiet down. Um, There are other people who, who maybe... For them, they just assumed that Jesus had told everybody else up to this point not to reveal that information, so maybe they're just telling them to be quiet because they don't want that information out. Or, or maybe, maybe it's a political issue because in Jerusalem, if you say anybody is king other than Caesar, there's an execution in your future. And in fact, that's exactly what will happen one week. If you start declaring anybody to be king, someone's going to die. Maybe that was the reason that the crowd was scolding him, or maybe they just understood the mission of Jesus. This is what's fascinating. There's no single reason. There's probably all of these reasons and more, and here's what we should know. It doesn't matter how different the reasons are. The outcome was always intended to be the same. Some people just need to be quiet. Keep your distance. And uh, the two blind men, their response to being told to be quiet is they just got louder. And uh, this, is, this is really interesting, right? They just shouted all the more. And, uh, and the result is Jesus stops. And he called out to them. Why? Because faith gets to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, Son of David, have mercy. They're seeing so much about Jesus. And he just stops. And he asks them the most important question. You remember last week we talked about the questions of God and the questions of Jesus and how incredibly penetrating they are and, and how deep that they go and how much they reveal. And, and he asks them what seems to be the obvious question, but maybe it's not as obvious as we think it is. He says, what do you want? What do you want? If I were to ask you to pull out a piece of paper and write down what do you want, I wonder what would make your list today. If it could only be a single thing, I wonder what would be the most important priority. Questions are really important. In fact, a lot of us who wish we had better relationships, we imagine that if we just said cleverer things, if we just said brighter things, if if we were more outgoing, if, if we were more extroverted, that somehow our relationships would be better. But I I would just say if you want really good relationships, ask questions. Now don't ask questions that put people on the spot, you know, like they do in a courtroom. Isn't it true that you are the most miserable human being that's ever existed on the face of the planet? Uh, that question is not going to get you much. Okay. And uh, what's happening? Well, Jesus wants to know what is their need. And you might think the answer is obvious, but if you're a person who has spent every day of your life sitting on the side of the road begging, 
Maybe for them, the obvious question is, I just need more money. Jesus stops and asks them because not only is it time, it is personal. You have to understand this about faith. You have to understand this about God. Like we're gathered in a sizable room and there's a number of us here and we're celebrating the good things that God has done for us and we're looking into God's word to learn more about him and, and we will pray prayers and we will serve each other and we will have conversations with each other and, and all of those things are good, but it's so easy in our faith journey to assume that it's all impersonal. It's some force we tap into it that God just kind of does just... Do, drive by mass healings. And with Jesus, it's always personal. So maybe what they wanted is money, because in the ancient world, the kind of social programs they had to assist those who had disabilities or diseased, that was begging. That's what you did. You sat on the side of the road, and you hoped that someone would be generous. And if you got enough money that day, you had food. If it was hot, you still sat on the road. If it was raining, you still sat on the road. If it was cold, you still sat on the road. If you took a day off, that was a day without food. So maybe, maybe they could get enough money to not have to sit on the side of the road for a while. That would be nice. But money wasn't their deepest need. The question is, will they trust Jesus with their deepest need? Not just looking for some kind of temporary relief, but the thing that's under the thing. If Jesus took one offering from that massive crowd, they might not have to beg again for years. But these men knew what to ask Jesus for. What they asked him for was their sight. And when they gave Jesus the answer to their deepest need, his response is to have compassion, and he does that every time. If you're just asking God to, to subsidize the situation you're in, it's not an inadequate request, and it's not something that he will turn away from. I honestly don't believe that Jesus would have been offended if they asked for money. But when they were willing to say what the issue really was, he had compassion on them. His heart went out to them. He felt something deep down inside of them, and it says he touched them. And I love this about Jesus. Not only are, are his words healing, but his hands are healing too. And because that they're diseased and disabled, most people would try, try to create a little distance. Jesus is close enough to touch them, and he's close enough to touch us. And immediately they received their sight, and Matthew says, and they followed Jesus, which when Matthew uses that word, it's always a word about becoming a disciple. Let's continue on in the next chapter. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks you, uh, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. There's that, that phrase again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jer Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Remember that? We've heard that phrase before very early in Matthew. When the wise men first came, the whole city was stirred. And they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So... Jesus is walking or he's actually riding into Jerusalem and people are finally recognizing who he is. 
They're seeing him as something more than just a teacher, an attraction or a distraction. How is he going to use this kind of influence? How is he going to use his power? Is he going to use it to prove himself? The answer is no. Jesus doesn't use his power to prove himself. This is one of the problems that people have in faith journeys is that they keep asking God to do something that proves who he is. Jesus comes to help those who have need. He's not making things better for himself. He's making things better for others. It's astonishing how many people or how people use the power that they have. And, and in case you think you don't have any, I guarantee you have some. None of us have as much as we want and more of us and uh, all of us have more than we think. And the question is with the authority and with the power that we do have, how do we use it? Do we try to, to leverage to get more? Uh, do we try to leverage so that someone else gets less? Uh, how do we think about the words we use and, and, and the interactions that we have? And, and Jesus is the only one who can be trusted with all power and all authority. That's a phrase that's going to show up in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus will say, all the power and all authority has been given to him. Why can he be trusted? Because he's not here to prove anything for himself. He's here to save us. How many are glad we have a savior like that? Yeah? Yeah. So he's on the Mount of Olives, he's approaching Bethpage, it's just a small village, and he tells his disciples, two of them, to go and, and they will find a donkey with her foal and to untie them and bring them. And, and, and this is actually a reference to an Old Testament prophecy. In Matthew's Gospel, there are 10 occasions in which an Old Testament prophecy is being fulfilled by something that's happening. Everything from the virgin birth to, to uh, 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 Jesus being born in Bethlehem to them having to flee to Egypt to uh, where he is going to live, what kind of ministry he's going to do. Uh, prophets like Micah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea, they're all referenced in Matthew's Gospel. And now we're introduced to another prophet, and that's the prophet Zechariah. And Zechariah is the one who made this prophecy about a king would come in and he would be riding on a donkey. These, these passages, when, when Matthew uses them, he's using them intentionally. What he's telling us is, I'm not just reporting an event, I'm giving you the context for what's going on. And, and this is really helpful for us. You would be surprised how much scripture gives context for what's going on in our world. The reason we have so much fear, so much anxiety, so much frustration being vented in our world today is because people are seeing events without seeing the context. And it makes them afraid and it makes them angry. And so Matthew's giving us the context. And it tells us that Jesus is going to ride in on the, the foal, a donkey. And, and, and it's not because he's tired. Uh, Jesus is used to walking. He's making a statement. He's the Messiah. But he's different than most people expected him to be. Jesus is revealing not just who he is and his authority, but he's also revealing his humility. And so he's using this opportunity. He's aware of the prophecy. And this is what it says in Zechariah, the ninth chapter. It says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious. And that's where most people put a period. Your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It is time. It is personal. He is here. He is here. The disciples want to know, if, well, if we go to get these animals and somebody asks us a question about it, what should we say? And he didn't say, the king demands it. He says, tell them that your Lord needs them. Interesting. He's revealing his humanity even in how he accesses resources. And Jesus knew the prophecy and he is showing everyone. He's using a visual aid to teach people 
who he is and how he will use his authority. He does not come into Jerusalem on a stallion, which is a war animal. He does not come in with pomp and circumstance. He sits on the foal of a donkey, an animal that is used to bear the burdens of others. He does not come to make people afraid. He comes to draw people to himself. You don't fight battles on donkeys. It's a liability. It's a sign of peace. You know, when God came down on Mount Sinai and gave the commands, it terrified everyone. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, everyone is attracted to him. So in his ride into Jerusalem, Jesus also doesn't say a single word. He just rides in. Jesus is being seen how he wants to be seen. There's no soldiers that are preceding him. There's no trumpets that are sounding. There's no chariots of state that he's riding in or going before him. There's no prancing ponies. There's none of that. And people are shouting Hosanna, which is a really interesting word. And what it means is save now. Save now. Now, we just witnessed a coronation of a king in our world, didn't we? King Charles. And uh, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance related to that. And there comes a moment which everybody shouts out, God save the king. Okay? Is that what's happening here? Are people saying, God save the king? And no, they're not. They're saying, save us and save us now. And they had no idea how close they were to the truth in that moment because Jesus did not come to save himself. Jesus came to give his life so that everyone there could be saved. That's why he's here. This is the reason Jesus came. And there's also a reference to Psalm 118. It says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's referring to Zechariah, and he's referring to Psalms to tell us this is a pivotal moment in human history. He's not just reporting events. He's telling us something spiritual that's happening. Salvation has come, but not the way they expected. Within a week, Jesus will be arrested, he'll be tried, he'll be convicted, and he'll be crucified. That will not look like salvation. That will look like failure. And that's part of our problem with God. The way he goes about things is not the way we go about things. And when he starts setting things in motions, we think it looks like failure. When you ask Jesus to save you, are your expectations something different than what he will do? And are your expectations something that would keep you from experiencing the actual salvation of Jesus? I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. Jesus didn't come just to moderately improve our lives. He's not come to subsidize just a lack that we have. It's time, it's personal, and he's here. So what is it you need? What is your greatest need? More money? More space, more opportunity, more friends, more time. It's not really until you get to your real need that you see Jesus for who he really is. And the blind men knew their real need. And they saw him more clearly than some of us today. Those two blind men used the phrase, son of David, and the crowds, as he approached Jerusalem, used the same term, son of David. That's why I put them together today. The light came on. People could tell. Is the light coming on for you today? Are you willing to trust God with your deepest need? Not just what makes things more comfortable or easier, the deepest need? Or are we going to insist that any answer God gives us has to be on our terms and in our way? 
And quite honestly, there's not a shortage of people who are embarrassed by the humility of Jesus. They would prefer Jesus who was boisterous and trash talking and name taking and door kicking and MMA fighting savior of the world. It's not how he comes. Jesus did not come to sell tickets. He came to seek and save those who were lost. And once we invite Jesus to help, he does way more than we expect. Would you bow your heads? Don't, don't let your expectations of Jesus keep you from the salvation of Jesus. It is time, it is personal, and he is here. Will you make him your king and your Lord, or will you ask this humble king to keep working in ways that make him serve you? Heavenly Father, we bring to you our deepest needs today. Not just the thing that will make life more comfortable, but our greatest, deepest needs, and we trust you with them. And we use the phrase, Lord, because we're putting you in charge of our lives, and Son of David, because you are the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and you come to us not to prove anything other than your grace. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.